Welcome to the art and science of mead, all about sulfites and sorbate too. Sulfites have been used since ancient times to preserve wine and other alcoholic beverages, but I find there's nothing more controversial among mead and wine makers as well as drinkers than the use of sulfites. Now I'm not intending or trying to change anyone's mind about sulfites. If you don't want to use sulfites in your mead or wine, that's your business. If you like what you're doing, keep doing it. The purpose of this video is to help educate and provide information to mead makers so that they can more effectively use sulfites to prevent unwanted microbial activity, to prevent oxidation, and also when used in conjunction with sorbate to stabilize mead and prevent refermentation later when it's bottled. For those who prefer not to use sulfites, I do have a few slides for best practices making a mead without sulfites. I hope that the information you find in this video is helpful. Thank you again for watching. Here's an overview of some of the topics that we'll discuss today when we're reviewing sulfites in the use of mead. I'll briefly review the history of sulfites in wine and alcoholic beverages, talk a little bit about some of the chemistry, including distinguishing between total, bound, free, and molecular sulfur dioxide. There are a lot of myths out there on the internet some of them are slightly misinformed and others are completely incorrect. We'll talk about some of those. And then I'll talk about how to add sulfite to your mead, what the sources are, when it should be used, and how to determine how much to add and uh, count for binding of sulfites that can happen sometimes. Occasionally, we might make a mistake and add too much sulfite, and I'll talk about how to manage that and reduce the levels. If you are making a mead with residual sugar, you'll need to use both sulfites in combination with sorbate to prevent re-fermentation in your bottle and bottle bombs. Some folks don't want to use sulfites in their mead, and that's perfectly fine. I'll talk a little bit about what are the best practices for preserving mead if you're going to go without adding sulfites. And then finally, I'll talk about how we can use them as a sanitation agent uh, for our equipment and other uh, tools that we use to make mead. So what are sulfites? When we are talking about sulfites, we're talking about sulfur dioxide, or SO2. Sulfites are used in food and beverages to preserve freshness and prevent spoilage. Alcoholic beverages are required to be labeled if they contain added sulfites. Sulfites have been used for a very long time. It was observed that in the ancient times that sulfur dioxide that was vented from volcanoes would kill vermin such as rats and other pests. And they began using it to fumigate dwellings and ships. They also learned the Greeks and Romans to burn sulfur in their uh, clay pots that they used to store their wine to prevent it from turning into vinegar. Obviously they had no idea what the underlying science was, but they did know this was a trick they could use to keep the wine from uh, turning. In the 1400s, the Germans also were using sulfites and preserving wine, and they added it by uh, burning a mixture of wood shavings, powdered sulfur, or incense and herbs. And although we don't know for sure, it's estimated that this method would produce about 18 parts per million of sulfites uh, in wine. There's sometimes some confusion between what sulfites actually are. Uh, 
on distinguishing between sulfur versus sulfides versus sulfites. So there's three main types of sulfur which are in wine and mead. Sulfur is the, the mineral or the element which can be found in certain amino acids. Sulfides with a letter D, including hydrogen sulfide, dimethyl sulfide or mercaptans, can add some unpleasant aromas. So these are definitely not wanted. The classic is hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten egg. Some of the other ones are a little bit harder to detect. Sometimes it's more of a loss of freshness or sometimes it's sort of a, a cooked vegetable or cooked cabbage or mercaptans can be uh, sometimes like onions or garlic or even, uh, even a, a hot asphalt. And then finally, there's sulfites with a letter T. And that's what we will be talking about in most of this presentation. We'll be talking about how to use sulfites in mead uh, and the different purposes that we use sulfites for. So what is the purpose of sulfites anyway? Why do we uh, add them to mead and wine? Well, first of all, it's an antioxidant and it helps preserve fresh aroma and color. You'll notice an old wine can sometimes be oxidized and it won't be as bright red. It'll be more of a brown or rust color. And in an old wine, that's to be expected, but sometimes that might be unwanted if you're trying to make something where you really want to pres preserve the fresh aroma and color, uh, for example, from the honey or from the fruit that you've used to make that mead. It's an antimicrobial. Uh, this is very important because it prevents unwanted microbial activity. So that could be some of the wild yeast or bacteria. And then also, especially if you use it in combination with sorbate, it can help prevent re-fermentation in your bottle and uh, with the corks being pushed out or worst case scenario, uh, the bottles themselves exploding. It also is an antioxidative enzyme. So it helps block uh, some of the enzymes that cause uh, enzymatic oxidation. Think of think browning in apples. After you cut an apple, uh, very short, soon afterwards, it'll start turning brown and that's from an oxidative enzyme. It can be a refresher, so if your meat is slightly oxidized but not too far gone that it's ruined, it, it can also help that. And then finally, you can use it as a sanitizing agent to sanitize the equipment that you use to make mead. So a little bit of the chemistry of sulfites, and I don't want to bore you too much, but it is kind of important to understand the differences between the type of sulfites because we often talk about this when we're talking about what type of sulfite we're adding or measuring. So the total SO2 or the total sulfites is basically just that. It's the free SO2 plus the bound SO2. The bound SO2 is that which is bound and unavailable. It's an important concept because when I was first learning how to do this, I would take a measurement, use a calculator and add uh, sulfites to my mead. And then I would measure it afterwards and it's as if it vanished and it didn't. What happened is a, a certain portion of that sulfite will actually become bound to certain things and become available. And then the free SO2 is basically that which is uh, biologically and biochemically active. And it consists of the bisulfite and then the molecular SO2. So the bound sulfites combine with polyphenols, sugar acids, and acetaldehyde. And basically they are biologically uh, inactive, they're basically unavailable, and so the free SO2 is really what we're talking about, which consists of the molecular, the bisulfite, and then the The molecular sulfur dioxide, or SO2, is non-ionized, and it's what is responsible primarily for the antimicrobial effects of sulfites. The bisulfite, the HSO3, is ionized, and that's the component of the free SO2 that's primarily responsible for the antioxidant effects. And then finally, there's the, the SO3, the sulfite, which is pretty much non-existent at the pHs that we have mead or wine at, typically, so it does not have any effect at all. And here's just a slide uh, showing the activity of of these various agents. And since most of our meat is going to be a, a pH of around you know, 3.2 to 3.8 or so, give or take a little bit, uh, it's important because we're trying to preserve our mead. And so we focus on the molecular SO2. In general, we want to have a target molecular SO2 of around 0.8 milligrams per liter. And this is dependent on pH. 
And so it's, you can see there at the bottom of the slide, it's something that if you're a little bit higher in your pH, you can really lose most of the molecular SO2 activity. And we'll talk a little bit about how to account for that here in a, in a moment. So if you're trying to aim for a molecular, molecular SO2 of 0 0.8 milligrams per liter, at a lower pH, say 3.2, you might only need a free SO2 of, say, 20 parts per million. But if your pH is only slightly higher, 3.7, you might need to add 60 parts per million of sulfite, a free, sul free SO2, which is a much larger amount, and it's all pH dependent. And so it's important to keep that in mind. When I was first learning how to use sulfites, I didn't ha even have the capacity to measure sulfites or, or how to measure pH. And so a lot of times we would just guess. But without knowing that, it's obviously possible to guess wrong. Now that I have the ability to measure both sulfites and pH, I can really dial in the free SO2 level to where I need it to be without using too much. Because that's the goal. We want enough sulfites present to preserve your mead over the long term, but not excessive amounts. Now, some microbes are more sensitive to sulfite than others. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the, the yeast that we uh, use, is semi-tolerant. And that's important because sometimes if you're making more of a wine and you're using fruit, sometimes you will sulfite the must or the fruit for, and then 24 hours later, pitch your yeast. And the selected strains of Saccharomyces that we use that are sold from the wine suppliers are often selected to be even more tolerant of sulfites than say the wild Saccharomyces. Now some of the other uh, bacteria and yeast are more tolerant than others. Uh, and it's important that we keep the free sulfites, uh, um, the molecular sulfites within a certain level to try to minimize the chance of an unwanted infection. Now there's a lot of myths about sulfites on the internet and people have very strong opinions about it. One of the problems though is that people have strong opinions and it's not necessarily based on fact. So here's one of the more common ones. Sulfites cause headaches. So I have to drink white wine instead of red wine because red wine always gives me headaches. Now it's true that red wine can give some people who are sensitive uh, headaches. So that's, that's true but it doesn't appear to be related to the level of sulfites themselves. And especially saying that they're going to drink white wine instead of red wine because the, they don't want to get a headache because of the sulfites is, is, all, is not correct. Because white wine actually has more sulfites on average than red wine. Red wine has tannins. It's uh, protected somewhat from oxidation. Uh, often red wine is barrel aged. And so you don't really need as much sulfites in a red wine to preserve it as you might in a white wine. So looking at a Average French white wine sold over the counter, it has about 105 parts per million of sulfites, whereas a red wine, uh, it's around 75 or so. So choosing a white wine over a red wine because you want lower sulfites to prevent headaches, uh, that's not, doesn't make any sense because typically white wines have higher sulfite levels. But there are other things in red wine that can cause headaches and it, it's thought to be possibly biogenic amines, such as histamine, tyramine, and perhaps even the tannins themselves. So people, there are people who do get headaches from red wine. It's just not the sulfites that's actually the cause. Another uh, opinion that people is, say is sulfites are unnatural in mead or wine. I don't want to add them because they're, they're unnatural. They don't belong there. And that's also not exactly correct. It's impossible to make a completely sulfite-free mead because the yeast produces some SO2 during fermentation, and the range can be anywhere from 5 up to 40 or more parts per million. There are some strains of wine yeast that are known to be high producers of sulfite compared to others. And when I do my own sulfite testing, I find that on average, the mead, after initially after primary fermentation and right around time of racking into the secondary vessel for further aging, it naturally contains around 5 or 15 parts per million of SO2. So if, if someone's commercial, they can't say that a, and they're going to sell their mead, commercial meadery, and they can't say that it contains no sulfites unless they actually send their mead off to a lab to prove that it's less than 10 parts per million. So sometimes what the TTB requires is they say no, it contains no added sulfites.
Sulfite allergy is common, another myth. A lot of people say, oh, I can't have sulfites, I'm allergic. And there are people who are sensitive to sulfites, there's no doubt about that, but it's not quite as common as, as many would like you to believe. There are some people that lack an enzyme, sulfite oxidase, and they cannot m metabolize sulfite. So they can get asthma, hives, nausea, some other sim GI symptoms. But true allergy uh, as an allergic reaction is very rare. It's maybe about 0.05% to 0.1% of the general population of people. Now, some people are more sensitive to sulfites, so that's, that's more common. And that can be a, a direct irritation from the sulfites themselves. So if any of you have used uh, sulfites to make a sanitizing solution and accidentally took a deep breath from that, it's very irritating. And if you have pre-existing asthma, it could certainly set off a, a reaction to that. But that's not really a true allergy to the sulfites themselves, but simply a reaction to the irritation from the sulfite itself. But the people who truly are, who either lack the enzyme or they truly are allergic to sulfites, what a lot of them seem to not mention or talk about it is if they truly have a sulfite allergy, they have to avoid other foods and beverages that are much higher in sulfites than we would ever find in meat or wine. And that includes lunch meats, uh, processed uh, fruit juices, dried fruits, and some other, other products. Here's a slide uh, from Paquette showing the differences in a comparison of sulfite levels from wine up through other things such as dried fruit. And so a dry red wine doesn't have very much, maybe 25 to 50 parts per million. A white wine may have a sulfite level of 80 to 110 parts per million. And as, as home mead makers, we have a choice. We don't have to use this much if we don't want to. We might only use need to use 25 or 30 parts per million to keep that molecular SO2 uh, to where it's going to have the antioxidant antimicrobial activity that we want without using too much. But if someone is able to eat either french fries or dried fruit like dried apricots, the levels in those foods are many times more than you'll find in wine or mead, anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 parts per million. So if someone says they can't drink wine with sulfites, but they're able to eat dried fruits or, or processed potato products like french fries, then they don't have a sulfite allergy. Maybe they don't want to have sulfites. Maybe they, there's a philosophical reason for them not to want to have them but they, they truly don't have an allergy and there's not a, a, a medical reason for them to avoid it, even though there might be personal preference why they might not want to. So the TTB and the FDA require labeling of all products which contain sulfites. And here's a little background about how this all came about. So there was a case reported in the 1970s where a teenager was on vacation in Europe with her family and she, uh, ate a lunch of hamburger and fries and she suddenly had hives and wheezing and they never figure out why that happened but it began happening off and on over the next several years and it also happened when she was exposed to two medications that were being used for her asthma and so this case report was published in the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association. It turned out that the inhalers actually contain sodium metabisulfite as a preservative and, you know, sulfites are irritating anyway, and if you have asthma, it certainly could even make it worse. And so when they exposed the patient to what they thought was the culprit, which was the sodium metabisulfite, uh, the symptoms came back. And so that's how uh, it got published uh, in the early 1980s in the Journal American Medical Association and how it came uh, to be uh, recognized by the FDA and TTB as possibly being a problem, especially if levels were so other cases were reported, and then they also found problems in that they were using sulfites in uh, salad bars, and there was not really any control of how they were using the sulfites or spraying them on. But, you know, imagine if you have lettuce sitting in a salad bar all day, and the cut parts start turning brown, that's not very appetizing. So they were spraying a sulfite solution onto the salad bar to prevent that happening. But there was no... Uh, regulation of that and you can imagine somebody would just spray it on there every five minutes and obviously you could get extremely high levels of sulfites and so that's how it came about that sulfites are not allowed to be used on fresh fruits or vegetables anymore and then any other products that have over 10 parts per million of sulfites they're required by the manufacturers uh, to label those products as containing sulfites.
uh, just in case people that are truly truly are sensitive or truly have a sulfite allergy so that they're aware of it and um, can avoid it. Adding sulfites to your mead. There's different sources to that we can use, including Camden tablets, uh, bulk uh, potassium metabisulfite powder, or you can make up a 10% sulfite solution. There's different times we consider adding sulfites, such as at racking, before filtering, or bottling, or at other times. Uh, there's ways to calculate how much sulfites to add, and there are effects upon pH primarily, but also a little bit from alcohol and temperature. And some of the other factors to consider that really isn't talked about very much in, in a lot of the literature, but is also really important, including binding of sulfites and then uh, loss of uh, atmospheric loss of the sulfites over time. And so I'll review all of these in this section of the presentation. A lot of us use Camden tablets when we first started out. They're easy because you could just count the number of tablets and you basically crush them into a little bit of water and then pour them in your mead. They are more expensive, however. Uh, any sulfite, whether it's a Camden tablet or, or a potassium metabisulfite powder, can go can lose uh, sort of the strength over time because the SO2 it, it can off-gas from that. Once you start making a lot more mead, then most of us start using the powdered potassium metabisulfite because it's a lot more economical and you can use it for a lot of things. You can make it uh, as a, into a sanitizing solution, uh, or you can make it into a 10% sulfite solution. Some folks rather use that to add the sulfites to their mead. Uh, one of the things that is important is you do need to have an accurate scale to measure this out. We don't recommend using a, like a teaspoon to measure it because it's not quite as accurate as using a scale. And you don't want to overdo it. We want to use just enough sulfites and no more. Well, how do you determine how much to add? For many years, I would just measure a certain amount or use cabinet tablets and just hope for the best. But it turns out there's a wide range of the effectiveness of sulfate depending on pH. So the lower the pH, the more effective the sulfate addition is and the less that you need to use. And so when you're trying to determine how much sulfites to add, it's very helpful if you have a pH monitor or a pH meter to measure the pH and to help you with your calculation. So temperature and alcohol can also affect it a little bit. Uh, we usually don't consider those in our calculators, although there are some online calculators that will take into account uh, the, the alcohol co content of your uh, mead. So here's a way to do the calculation. Uh, it, let's say you have five gallons of mead and your pH is 3.6. You've measured your sulfite, you have a sulfite meter and it's 10 parts per million, which is lower than you want it to be, obviously. And so as per the table, if you have a pH of 3.6, you want the molecular SO2 to be 0 0.8 milligrams um, per liter, which means you'll have to arrange for a, a free SO2 around 50 parts per million at that pH. So if your desired uh, free SO2 is 50 parts per million, you take away the 10 that's already there, so you'll need to add 40 parts per million of sulfite. So how many grams to add? There's a formula for this. I'm not gonna talk about and review these calculator. You can read them. But basically you can calculate out how many grams you'll need to add, which will be 1.31 uh, grams. So let's say you did that. It's your first sulfite addition. You added the 1.3 grams to your batch of mead. You measured the free SO2 24 hours later and surprise, it was only 18 parts per million. Where did it all go? Well, this is something that I was unaware of when I was first starting out, but there is the possibility for the sulfate, especially the first edition or two that you do to be bound. And that's why I found in hindsight, I was probably under sulfiting a lot of the meads that I had made over the years. And that's why I had problems with them going bad or, or becoming oxidized. So there are other factors that will affect how much free SO2 is present, including whether there's dissolved oxygen. Um, if there's a lot of dissolved oxygen, let's say you were not very careful when you racked the meat, it splashed a lot. Well, remember the SO2 is an antioxidant, so it'll be consumed by that. If there's solids present, like if it's a very cloudy mead, uh, you know, with a lot of yeast particles, a lot of those can absorb a, a large amount of the sulfite addition. So there are certain situations I'll purposely overdose. Uh, 
much higher than the calculated addition to overcome that. So with my first addition, I know that a certain portion is going to become bound. After the first or second additions, there's some bound present, so then I will not need to add, overshoot as much. Although I still might do that if there's leaves present or if it's a cloudy mead as compared to a, a clear mead. And you can get away with overdosing on purpose earlier on because you're going to be doing some more racking and there's going to be a lot of time before you get that meat into a bottle. So you're going to be having some loss of the sulfites over time. So I don't worry too much about over sulfiting early on, such as my first edition or so. But then later, as I get close to the time of bottling, then I want to be more careful because I don't want to over sulfite. You know, there, it's, it is possible to do that and it is a problem. So I, the more sulfites are added, the percentage of SO2 which is bound decreases, which is why with further additions, you don't need to overshoot as much. And then those calculators I can use that you find online are much more going to be much more closer in predicting how much an addition will actually add to your meat. So cloudy meat, I already mentioned this. If there's yeast or particular matter such as fruit, it can absorb some or a lot of your addition. Uh, making a lot less available after. So that's where I might also overshoot if it's still fairly cloudy and hazy. If there's lees or, pre or sediment present, that can absorb a huge amount of your sulfite addition. So if I'm planning on racking anyway, what I usually do is I rack first, and then I add the sulfite immediately as soon as it has been transferred over to the other vessel. And that's how I avoid uh, that absorption or I minimize that amount of absorption. If the meat already is slightly oxidized, there's acetaldehyde, uh, that will bind to the sulfite and decrease the sulfite level available. Uh, if it's oxidized, it also has some more O2 present as well. So that would be a situation where you'd want to increase your calculated, increase to a dose higher than what your addition that was calculated by one of those calculators. There really isn't a way to calculate how much to add. Sometimes I only add 25%, sometimes I might even go as high as doubling the dose and that that just comes with experience uh, if you're not sure then you can always just retest it 24 40 hours later to see what you got and if, if it wasn't enough then you can do another addition and barrel aging is going the, the wood itself will absorb the so2 plus there's a higher level of so2 or a higher level of o2 present which will absorb the so2 as well uh, with barrel aging there's going to be some tannins present and uh, that can minimize how much sulfites you might need to use to preserve your mead, especially if it's going to be a dry mead. Uh, but we'll talk about some of the effects that tannins have upon uh, preventing oxidation a little later in the presentation. Well, another factor to consider uh, when you're trying to determine how much sulfite to add is adding one large addition versus adding many smaller additions. It's it's much better to use one large addition, especially up front. So there's different reasons, but one is that smaller re repeated additions don't seem to have quite as strong an antimicrobial effect, and you're more likely to have binding as compared to giving a fewer but a larger addition. You really want to hit those bugs that are in there that you don't want hard with the sulfate, so it's better to use a larger addition. And even if you're nervous about overshooting, just keep in mind that excess sulfites added soon after active fermentation has finished will tend to decline over time with sedimentation and repeated racking. Later on, you might want to be more careful in calculating how much sulfite to add, and you might not want to add as much, uh, but at least at first, it's better to overshoot, or not purposely overshoot, but, but give more than the calculation says so that you can account for binding and make sure you have the effect that you want. So what are the times when you should consider adding sulfites? If you're making a, a, a wine or a melamel in which you're using fruit or fresh pressed juice that's overripe and perhaps it's even starting to ferment on its own, or maybe there's some wild yeast or mold on there, uh, what we'll often do is add sulfites to the must and then let it sit for 24 hours before you pitch your selected strain of yeast. I don't do this every time. And if the fruit is pretty clean, it's not started to, to ferment and you know, certainly frozen fruit that you might buy is not going to have that problem. But if I'm picking the fruit right off the, 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 the bush or the tree, and it just seems like it's a little bit overripe, then I'll do that and give it 24 hours. And so by adding the sulfates before pitching the yeast, you're going to give your yeast a head start. 
it'll it might not kill off all of the wild microbes, but it'll stun them because they're not as resistant to sulfites as selected wine uh, strains are. But if you're making a traditional mead, of course, uh, with honey and water, and there's no fruit uh, in it, you're not going to have to do this. And certainly if you're using canned fruit or fruit juice, that's, that also doesn't have anything growing in it. So you don't have to do it for any of those other situations, only if you're using overripe fruit or fruit juice. So another situation where you time that you will think about adding sulfates is after primary fermentation is done, and now you're going to transfer it over to the secondary vessel for aging. The yeast is no longer actively fermenting, and so now you must pr protect the mead from oxidation. And most of the time, my first sulfate addition is around or at the time of my first racking. I also think about adding more sulfites if I'm doing any later additions of more solids, because these will consume any sulfite that's already in your mead. So that could be adding fruit uh, to your secondary vessel, or it could be adding honey, such as when you're back sweetening. And uh, that's a time when I might uh, add some more sulfite. When racking, you can lose as much as 10 to 20 uh, parts per million of free SO2, depending on how careful you are, uh, how much headspace is present, whether the uh, carboy was filled with inert gas first, such as uh, CO2. Uh, but you can lose a little bit and keep that in mind. Uh, and you may want to uh, add a little bit of sulfite at that time. Or at the very least, if you might want to measure your sulfites after you've done the racking to see if the level is declining, if you need to add any more. Uh, before filtering, any process where there's a risk of the mead being exposed to oxygen. So uh, if, it's, if you're going to filter it and it has a low level of sulfites and there's a little oxygen added during filtration, that could be a problem. And then right before bottling, I always do one last test of my sulfites at the minimum to make sure that the levels are where I want them to be. And this is where I'm very careful. If I'm going to add some, it's, I'm going to be very careful to use the calculation calculators. Because, because by now, you should have plenty of bound sulfites there. And you're just going to try to get that free SO2 up to the level that you need it to be based on the pH so that the molecular SO2 is going to be at least 0 0.8 milligrams per liter. So that way, your mead will be protected in the bottle long term. Some of the things you might want to consider when you're adding sulfites, if there's excessive headspace, that can be a problem. And we all know that you really want to have your carboys filled up. And this is after active fermentation is done, of course, but when you're doing a long-term bulk aging, whether it's in a glass carboy or some other container. But sometimes, I've been there, I don't have a storage vessel that uh, has um, exactly the size for the volume that I'm going to store. Uh, I've seen people using things like marbles and things to put up the volume, and I guess that can work, but I, I make a lot of mead, and I, I I make gallons of mead, and so that would be a lot of marbles, and so I, I don't really play around with that. I never have, but one of the ways that you can help minimize any problems of oxidation when you're having excess headspace is you can top off that with an inert gas, such as CO2. And what you do is you, you uh, put the little tube and, and connect that with your CO2 tank, the same CO2 that you maybe use for carbonating your mead. And I don't just put it in there for a couple of seconds. I let it flow in there very slowly over the top of the surface. And not only are, are you trying to cover the, uh, the mead, because even if there's a little oxygen left in that headspace, it's going to mix around. It's not like it's going to be completely at the top of your container. But what you're also doing is you're kind of blowing out. So any of the air that's in that headspace, by blowing it out with the CO2, uh, it'll help remove some of the oxygen in that headspace. But just remember, anytime you open that vessel up, anytime you open it to take a, take a little tasting or to take some meat out for testing, a little bit of oxygen will be introduced. And so that can help, but it's not going to be completely preventing the problem. And then remember, too, if there's even if that headspace is purged with CO2, because there's a larger surface area, there's more evaporative loss of sulfites out of the meat itself. It just simply goes out and the sulfite doesn't care whether it's air or oxygen or CO2. It's going to um, basically uh, leave the, the, um, the, the, the meat itself and go up into the headspace. So if I have a batch that has more headspace than I like, I test and I add sulfites more frequently into those batches. Ideally, again, we should have it all the way topped up and not have any headspace at all. But sometimes when you're making a lot of batches, you don't have a perfect vessel and you have to have it for uh, 
a little bit of time with uh, more headspace than you like. And this is how I, I compensate for that until I can finally get the level or, or get the volume into a container that actually it can fit in without headspace. Here's some calculators that I find very useful. I did show the formulas on how to do this, but I'm lazy. I'd rather not do the math. I might just enter the numbers into a, a calculator. So Winemaker Magazine is one of them. Um, another is the Australian Wine Research Institute. There's actually quite a few calculators on that website, and it's very helpful. And then Wine Business Monthly also has some calculators available. Well, sometimes we make a mistake and we put we oversulfite our mead, and that's a problem. And we, we if you if you made mead long enough and use sulfate long enough, you sometimes will oversulfite. So this uh, section, I'll talk about how to manage that. Ideally, it's best to prevent, but if it happens, sometimes we have to do something to try to fix it. So one of the ways to avoid excess SO2 is if you are planning on making an acid addition, add the acid first, then test the sulfate, and then add sulfate based on that. And the reason for this is acid will lower the pH a little bit. And so whatever your pH is, if you add enough acid to lower that pH, it can uh, make there be more free SO2 present. And so basically I, I add the acid, I test the free SO2 to determine how much is present, and then I add based on that as well as whatever the, um, the change in the pH was. If you add it the other way around, you could actually have some more free SO2 present because of the lowering of the pH. And always measure your sulfite additions using a precise scale. That's probably the main recommendation on preventing excess sulfite is take accurate measurements. Ideally, don't do it after you've had a bunch of mead to drink either, because if you're maybe not uh, paying as much attention, it's easy to add a little bit more than, or a lot more than you should. So what can you do? You accidentally oversulfited. Uh, what can you do about it? If you oversulfate it, it can cause a burnt match aroma and also cause bleaching of color. So it's obviously something that we don't want. Some people are more sensitive to the uh, sulfite aroma than others. My personal threshold is around maybe 75 to 80 parts per million. I know that because I did a little trial once and I had different levels and to where I could actually detect it by, by smelling it. Uh, but my wife is much more sensitive. I, she can detect sulfites down to you know, even 40 or 50 parts per million, which is really not out of the range of what we, we might actually be using uh, to sulfate appropriately. So some people are more sensitive to the aroma than others. And the other pro problem is it can sometimes bleach uh, the color due to the effects upon anthocyanins. So if you added too much sulfites, you can wait. If they're only slightly high, then they'll usually go down with time due to atmospheric loss. And every time you maybe do a procedure with it, such as rack it into another container. Uh, sometimes you can rack it a few times on, on purpose to try to lower the sulfite levels, or if you're using larger volumes or perhaps you're commercial, you might do a pump over. So basically it'll be volatized as gas, and then any oxygen that gets it, it gets exposed to will also reduce the free sulfites. Or you can add hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide, it's the same thing that we use as a, uh, you know, as a disinfectant. It's a powerful oxidizer. And I want to point out, this is, uh, I don't think this is legal to do if you're a commercial metery. Uh, I don't think uh, this is allowed as an addition uh, by the TTB. I'm not sure. I'm not a commercial mead maker um, uh, or not yet. But I don't think this is something that, um, that you could do as a commercial meter maker. But you could as a home brewer. But you have to be very, very careful because if you miscalculate, there's a high risk of oxidizing and totally ruining your batch of mead. Uh, I recommend diluting it in water. And the reason for that is if you just put the hydrogen peroxide right into the mead, you're not going to be able to stir it fast enough to prevent it from oxidizing whatever parts of the mead it comes in contact with. So usually I dilute it in some water. Uh, and then it's better to add small additions. So add a little bit, retest your sulfate a day or two later. And if you need to drop it some more, then, then add a little bit more. Um, and try to avoid over-treating with this, because obviously if you lower the sulfate levels to too low, less than 10 parts per million, then you, your meat is now at risk of oxidation, and so you've lost the benefit of having sulfate present. Uh, 
There are calculators available online for how to do this. Uh, but again, I, it's not something I really encourage, but if your levels are much too high and there's not a way to get rid of them through racking or doing a pump over, uh, there is the ability to lower it with hydrogen peroxide. And this is really sort of a last resort option. So I'm just mentioning it here so that you're aware of it and you know how to calculate how to and how to do this and how to calculate it. But really, it's not something that I encourage unless unless there's really all other options haven't worked. Stabilization of mead with sorbate. If we're going to make a mead that is going to have residual sugar, and we don't have the ability to do true sterile filtration as a commercial meadery would, uh, one of the ways to prevent the sugar from starting to ferment again when it's in the bottle is to be using something called sorbate or sorbic acid in combination with sulfite. And sorbic acid was discovered in 1859 from a mountain ash tree. And basically combined with sulfites, it will prevent fermentation from initiating. But one key point is it won't stop an active fermentation. I know of people who've tried this and with limited or, or mixed results. This is something that you would add after active fermentation is done, but before you back sweeten the mead or before you bottle the mead. And because it's mainly to prevent re-fermentation, it's not needed in a dry mead because obviously if there's no residual sugar present, there's nothing for any yeast um, to start fermenting. And so you don't have to use it in a dry mead, only in one with residual sugar. Well, how does it work? It basically interferes with the function of certain enzymes in the cell of yeast and other fungus. And these enzymes are involved in carbohydrate metabolism as well as other metabolic pathways. The amount that you use will depend on the, the ABV, the alcohol. So the higher the alcohol, the more effective it is. And that's kind of truthful in general. If you have a high alcohol meat, it's a lot less likely to ferment because the alcohol has some fungostatic effects as well upon the, the mead. And so a higher alcohol in general will be somewhat protective, although not completely protective. So sorbate is also less effective the higher pH, the pH is, but usually this is not much of an issue as it is with sulfate. With sulfates, it's very important to know what the pH is, but most of the sorbate effect in mead will be 90% or more effective if the pH is less than 3.7. So most of our meads should, at least by time of bottling, have a pH of less than that. There is a sensory threshold for sorbate. The, uh, the TTB limits of how much you can put into it if you are a commercial mead maker planning to sell it. There are some tasters that can detect levels as low as 130 milligrams per liter. And in general, I try to avoid levels much higher than 150 milligrams per liter. I'm relatively blind to this. I've done taste. I've done tasting aroma trials. I made really extremely high um, sorbate samples to see if I could even tell if it was in there, and I, I couldn't even I couldn't even determine that it was in there. So that's one weakness. So when I'm judging um, in a competition, if someone says they they think that they uh, detect a high level of sorbate, I'll, I'll I'll pretty much I won't have any say in that because I know that this is something that I'm relatively blind. But some people are are much more sensitive and able to detect levels that are fairly low. The recommendations based on uh, Pinot's uh, publication, uh, based on the uh, alcohol uh, content, so the higher the alcohol, the less uh, sorbic acid you'll need. Now remember, potassium sorbate is not 100% sorbic acid, so you will have to calculate that based on it being only 74% sorbic acid. And again, you can do the math by hand if you like to do that, but there are also calculators available uh, that will basically do this calculation for you. You just have to enter the volume and then the alcohol content and it'll figure it out. And here are the calculators, the Australian Wine Research Institute. And then the Facebook group, uh, Modern Mead Makers, has a great spreadsheet there for, uh, for this and sulfite and back sweetening. So I encourage you to, to check those sites out. So what are the potential issues with sorbate? Well, first it has to always be used together with sulfites. Uh, certain yeast and bacteria will not be inhibited by sorbic acid at all. So the sulfites help protect against any of those microbial infections. And also the sulfites are uh, necessary for an antioxidant purposes. You never wanna use sorbate if there's any chance of a malolactic fermentation because certain types of malolactic bacteria can convert the sorbic acid into 
2-ethoxyhexa-3,5-diene, uh, giving it the geranium fault. And, and I want to stress, this is not the same as geraniol, which is another compound that you can sometimes uh, sense uh, you know, from other sources. The compound is actually the 2-ethoxyhexa-3,5-diene, but it does smell like uh, geranium leaves, and it's an unpleasant thing. So if there's any chance of malolactic bacteria being present, you do not want to use sorbate. And the other problem is it does put a shelf life on your mead, and I can't tell you exactly how long that shelf life is. Is it two years or five years? But over time, it'll be changed uh, into ethyl sorbate, which can give like a pineapple or celery aroma. So if you have a mead that you've used sorbate in, it, it's something that really needs to be consumed while still young. Uh, and again, I can't tell you how soon that's going to happen. It's probably going to depend on a lot of things, the temperature at which the meat is stored and perhaps the alcohol level and other factors. But just be aware of that. So what do you do if you don't want to use sulfites? And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to convince anybody to use sulfites. There are folks that don't want to add sulfites to their, their meat or wine, and that's, that's perfectly fine. That's their choice. So what are the best practices for trying to preserve your mead without using sulfites? So there's some that do truly have an intolerance or allergy and just can't uh, get any sulfites in their, in their diet. Others just don't want to have them because of personal preference. Uh, there are some commercial meaderies who make mead without added sulfites because they're marketing to people who have that, or maybe it's their own personal philosophy. For decades, winemakers have tried to find a replacement for sulfites that had both the antimicrobial effects and the antioxidant effects, but there really isn't a compound available that exactly replicates all of the beneficial effects of SO2. So when you're making mead without using added sulfites, so I, I like to consider the following. You need to be very careful about sanitation because you really do not want, you won't have the protection of the sulfite. So you don't want to have any unwanted microbial infections. So sanitation is extremely important anyway, but it's even more important if you're not going to have the, the backup protection of having added sulfites. Be very careful of, to avoid adding unwanted oxygen after fermentation is complete, such as when racking. You should use only closed top fermenters and purge any empty headspace with inert a gas. And this can help prevent, or I should say minimize unwanted oxidation, but by itself, it might not be enough to prevent it completely. There are some styles of mead that can be successfully made uh, or more successfully made without added sulfites compared to other styles. So those with higher alcohol tend to do better. So sack strength mead or Polish style meads. And some of them, you might even want some oxidation because uh, the acetaldehyde can, can provide a nuttiness, almost like a sherry. Uh, and so that might be something that you actually find desirable. Higher, so higher alcohol uh, meads can, can get away without added sulfites. If you're aging on the yeast lees itself, the Sir Lees method, the yeast lees will release some compounds which have reductive effects. And reductive, I think of reductive effect as being the opposite of oxidative effect. So aging Sir Lees can be helpful as well. And then high levels of tannins are protective because tannins have antioxidant properties, and that's one of the reasons why a red wine or a piment uh, that has a high amount of tannins does not require quite as much uh, sulfites, at, uh, even if you're going to use them, as you would otherwise. So high levels of tannins can help you uh, preserve your mead without having to add sulfites. There are some styles, though, that are much more difficult to make successfully without using added sulfites. It's very difficult to preserve the freshness of a light, crisp, fruity style or low alcohol mead long term without sulfites. And so if you are going to make them, then just they're not meant for aging, but you should enjoy them while they're young within six months or of a year afterwards. Well, how about using sulfites for sanitation? So you can use a sulfite solution uh, for sanitation of equipment. Uh, the addition of citric acid to that makes the solution more effective. Uh, one recipe is three tablespoons of potassium metabisulfite with three tablespoons of citric acid. You dissolve it in a small amount of water, warm water, in a one gallon container. And once it's all dissolved and mixed, you add cold water and add the citric acid. And you can seal it tightly and, and use it within a few months. 
you don't want to use it for sanitizing stainless steel because pitting can result. If you do, you want to make sure you wash it, wash it off immediately. And don't breathe in the fumes. If you ever uh, get exposed to this, you're going to be coughing and sputtering, and it's some, one thing that you, you know you need to avoid. Using sulfites for storing uh, empty barrels. So you can use used oak barrels, uh, or you can preserve used oak barrels uh, by using sulfites. So traditionally, they would burn a stick or pellet of sulfur within a dry oak barrel, and then it's sealed and it's repeated every few weeks. Uh, you don't want the sulf uh, sulfur to, as it burns to drip in the barrel. It can form sulfuric acid and some other things that you don't want. Another method is you can make a, a mock wine or mock mead uh, with a sulfite citric acid solution. So for every liter of barrel capacity, you can have one liter of water with two grams of potassium metabisulfate and one gram of citric acid. And it's more convenient than burning the, the, the pellet or stick of sulfur, but be aware it will remove some of the oak flavor over time. The best way to store an oak barrel is full of, of meat or wine, but there are times you know, between batches where you might not really have a, a chance to do that, and so you'll have to have it stored either uh, empty with uh, the burning the stick or, of sulfur in it or using the, the mock uh, wine or mock mead um, solution to help uh, preserve it. Here are some of the references that I used in creating this presentation. Uh, don't take my word for this or for anything I say. I encourage you to look up these references. Uh, look up these references yourself and make uh, learn for your own and make up your own mind. And all of these should be available uh, once we have the PDF copies of this uh, presentation also available for your future reference and learning. Well, that's the end of our video about sulfites and sorbate for preserving and stabilizing mead. I hope you found the information helpful. If you did, please check out the rest of our videos on our YouTube channel, The Art and Science of Mead. Thank you.